Yeah, the car industry is so amazing right now because we're at like a renaissance period. Corey Steuben is here with us today. Welcome, Corey. Thank you once again. I'm so glad to be here. This is one of my favorite podcasts. So thanks for having me, Herbert. <laughs> Thank you, Corey. By now, most people know that Tesla has been cutting the prices of their cars over and over again since the beginning of this year. The big question now is, how will the traditional car makers respond? Luckily, our guest today is an industry expert and is the perfect person for us to ask these questions. During this tough economic environment, it's actually the gas car companies that are suffering, and I mean suffering. Now that Teslas are at or near price parity, will this accelerate the death of the gas cars? I've got so many questions. If Tesla continues its volume in lieu of margin strategy, what will happen to the pure play EV makers like Rivian and Lucid? How will the Chinese manufacturers like BYD and Xiaopeng respond? And of course, we need to ask about the upcoming launch of the Cybertruck and whether Tesla should and will end up advertising. So I've had the opportunity to interview Corey before, where he reviewed Tesla's greatest advantages. Corey is the president of Monroe & Associates. He, along with Sandy Monroe, who is the founder of the company, and his team members are experts in reverse engineering and teardown benchmarking. With 40 years of experience in the auto industry, they've helped companies reduce time to market, R&D, engineering, and manufacturing costs while increasing the quality of their customers' products. The easiest way to get to know them better is by checking out Monroe Live on YouTube. They have a very successful channel with over 52 million views in just the last several years. And they just launched a new amazing podcast series. I'm definitely looking forward to that. Corey, today I'd love for you to help me get brighter about the overall car industry. Yeah, the car industry is so amazing right now because we're at like a renaissance period. Um, transitioning away from internal combustion engine vehicles is really a once in a lifetime or once in a multi-generation type of transition. And so I'm just happy to be a part of this uh, journey. And I, I know that your viewers are real interested in the volume versus margin question. And, and working with Sandy, we run a small business. So we're always trying to guide Monroe and Associates through periods of growth and also periods of profitability. So if we just were focused only on profitability, we could make all sorts of cuts to our operating expenses. We could trim the staff and uh, batten down the hatches and make a lot of profit. But what would suffer is our ability to grow and innovate. And if you look at Tesla, they balance, they've had a rapid uh, period of both growth and margin, and they can play with margin to actually accelerate growth. And uh, when I talk about growth, that's growth in market share and in revenue. So you can actually get revenue growth with trimmed margin if you really just start to continue to cut prices. And what's really important is as long as you're not trading all of your profit for growth and the growth still matches at least a bare minimum of 30%. So oftentimes in industry or if you're running a business, you want your growth and your profitability to equal 30%. So if you have 15% profit, so EBITDA, and 15% growth, that's a really stable trajectory. If you have 30% growth and no profit, that means you reinvested all of your profit into your, your activities that are helping you grow. That's actually almost equally as good. Companies like Amazon have had tremendous growth over the years, but they've had years with almost no profit where they paid very little taxes. So with Tesla, with their price cut strategies, the one thing they're solidifying is they're solidifying their position in the market by getting the vehicles in customers' hands. And I think that's so important because once you get a Tesla in someone's hands, the loyalty is strong and it's very hard for someone to choose a traditional player once you're in. And um, I was kind of asked a similar question uh, yesterday on a, on a different interview, and I equated it to Apple products. And mm -hmm. once you're in Apple's ecosystem or once you're in the Android ecosystem, the thought of transitioning from an Android phone to an Apple product or an Apple product to an Android phone is like religion, you know? And I think with uh, uh, automobiles moving forward, they'll be so much more tied to the software-defined aspects, the software-defined vehicles. So. Um, 
this is just a, a crazy period of time in the automotive industry. And I think the next 10 to 20 years are going to be wild. Okay, so this is great because uh, you just right out answered the question, right? Which is Tesla's volume versus margin strategy, which they explained further in the last earnings call. Sounds like you're very much on board with that. So let me ask you this question, right? So um, a year ago, right, around you know February, March, April of last year, both Tesla's Gigafactories in Berlin was just launched, and then in April, Giga Texas was launched, right? And at that point, this is just before the war that ha that was uh, that mm -hmm. happened. This is before the macro inflation started happening, and you know that already. Elon at that point was already forecasting that he sees a uh, recession coming. He'd already been warning about it. Yeah. But if you are Tesla and you have these two factories already built, I think they had a choice to make at that point, right? Do I continue to invest, grow the scale, make it happen? Or do I cut back and maintain my high margins, lower the volume of production because I'm expecting there's not going to be enough buyers? Um, but instead, what they decided to do was continue to invest. And now they're producing the number of cars that they're expecting to produce, maybe delayed a little bit, but not, not terrible. And now they need to cut prices in order to continue selling, right? So that was their decision at that point. And just yesterday or two days ago, they made an announcement with the 10Q that they're going to increase the capital expenditures even more, 7 to 9 billion instead of 5 to 7 billion uh, for this coming year. So what was your thinking about this? And did you agree with this strategy? And would you have done the same? So I agree with the strategy as long as it aligns with the mission of the company. So Tesla's mission is not short-term profitability. And oftentimes other organizations beyond the automotive mm -hmm. industry are focused on quarterly profits, uh, mm -hmm. annual profits, because you may have somebody's the leadership's bonus or compensation tied to these goals, these sustained quarterly or annual uh, targets. And a company like Tesla, their mission is to transition the world to sustainable energy. I mean, I don't know the exact mission, but Elon has said he's trying to push the envelope in getting the whole world to switch over to electric vehicles and more renewable energy sources. Uh, and that was highlighted by the presentation that was given by uh, Elon and his extended team at the Investor Day, which Sandy and I had the privilege to attend. So that being said, if you look at Tesla investing seven to nine billion instead of five to seven, that's going to take short-term cash as well as a reduction in margin. That's uh, less profitability. You're going to continue to push vehicles out and invest in building more plants because right now Tesla's only in, I'd say three and a half to four segments with the cyber truck coming on. You'll be in the large truck segment, but they're not in the small truck segment. They're not in the tiny SUV segment. They, um, they don't have a wide array of uh, sedans or really, really small compact cars. So in order for Tesla to hit that 20 million mark by 2030, which would be 25% of global production, they need to offer cars in all segments. And if you're going to offer cars in all segments, you need several more manufacturing plants. So the announcement of the Mexico plant, and there has to be more plants throughout the world, even if they get them, even with all the advantages they have with how the vehicles are going to be built, that'll only uh, increase the amount of vehicles produced per plant by, I think, about 40 or 50% uh, based on square cars manufactured per square footage. And ultimately, these are aggressive goals that align with the company's mission. And if the company's mission was pure profitability, they could raise the prices, uh, shutter plants, and make huge amounts of money and be more of a bespoke premium automaker. So if Tesla wanted to shift into being a bespoke premium automaker, that would be like a Maserati or a Ferrari mm -hmm. or a Porsche, where you have some volume models, but really have high end margins. And I think like the Porsche 911 is a great example. Um, I heard anecdotally that the manufacturing cost of a Porsche 911 is very low. It's in the $30,000 range, 35. <laughs> 
Wow. They get all the money because the, of the customization. You can order it with special brakes and special special wheels, different colors, interior, you know, the leathers, the the carbon fiber packages, the wings, the you know, it's like endlessly customizable. And that's why the average selling price for a Porsche 911 GT4, uh, you know, fully loaded is like 180 or 250,000 US dollars. And uh, the base Porsche 911s are like 100, 120,000. So with luxury goods comes luxury margins, but that's not serving the mission of getting these electric vehicles in the hands of as many people as possible. So you have to really look at what's the what's the mission of the company and do the decision the business decisions align with that growth or glide path. Gotcha. I love it. This is good. Okay. You're always uh, a business person. You're the president, so you think of it this way, which I love. I'm going to show you several graphs and I would love to get your reaction to these, okay? So the first one is this is what happened to price cuts, right? In January, Tesla announced across the board price cuts. So you can see the Model 3, the old prices are in the second column. And then the new prices are in the first column. And then you can see, for example, the Model 3 was reduced by 6%. And you can see the Model Y was reduced by 20% and so forth. And so you, you can see the new prices. The Model 3 is $43,000, quote $44,000. And the Model Y is at $53,000, okay? Now, then just last week, just before the earnings call, they did another announcement of price cuts in reducing the amounts even more, $3,000 for the Model Y and, and $2,000 for the Model 3. So now a Model 3 is under $40,000 and a Model Y is $47,000. So another 6 to 5% reduction in prices. This is a, a recent study that was just done, very large, well-done study that asked the question, what is the number one reason or what is the top reason why people are not buying an electric vehicle today? And the answer is still cost. That is still one of the major reasons. It came to cost. The second is charging stations availability, battery tech's not available, prefers a gas engine and so forth. So the, the question I have for you is like, you know, with them reducing the prices like this, with cost still being the top priority for electric vehicles, what is the effect on OEM, the, the traditional car makers? And um, would you would you uh, agree that you know they need to reduce the prices of their cars to sell more? Um, and just another data point to throw out here is that um, the prices of the Model Three and the Model Y today is the same as when they first launched it in model the model 3 in 2018 and the model y in 2020 2020 this is you know uh, covid economies caused the prices to skyrocket therefore higher margin and now what they're just doing is bring it back to what they originally intended um yeah, yeah what's your thoughts on this so a couple things cost so i think elon stated that they've been able to pull out i think 30 percent of the cost of the right. model 3 since they launched it and we've seen that We've seen those improvements because yes. oh. we tore down an original Model 3. And if you look at a Model Y compared to a Model 3, the improvements in the body with the Giga castings, even the body side inner, so some of the large steel pieces went from multi-piece weld mints to large uh, hot stamp, which are high strength steel. The way that they monitor the temperature and the BMS on the batteries was reduced from uh, five sensors to two on each BMS. The hardware four or the the Gen four drive unit that's now in the vehicle um, has, which will soon be in the vehicle, with the integrated oil filter, the hairpin uh, stator, the uh, aluminum rotor for the front induction motor, the reduction in silicon carbide use. It goes. The list goes on and on and on and on. So they were selling that Model Three in the early days, essentially at break even or at a loss. Um, and we did a should cost at about $36,000, I think for a all wheel drive long range model three back in 20, uh, 2018, that was the total bill of material costs. And they were selling it, uh, for about 50,000, the vehicle we bought, that's all wheel drive long range. And I know you mentioned 39,000, that must be for the short range rear wheel drive, which they didn't really sell that very many of. And um, the margin is is really 
razor thin early on. But as companies produce at scale, if they're willing to innovate at a rapid pace, they can pull that cost out. And they have. So price versus cost is very important because Tesla has been relentlessly attacking their cost structure. They've also been adding some feature. They've added some cost back in. In 2020, all Model 3s now get a heat pump with the super manifold and octo valve, mm -hmm. which, which brings more value to the customer. So you want to serve the mission of getting as many EVs in, in people's hands as possible, but you also want to serve the customer because if you don't have a phenomenal customer experience, people will bail and abandon your, your, uh, your products. And I think one of the strongest elements of a t as, a, as a Tesla owner, what they have, is that people uh, who have Teslas will take their friends and other people in a ride, and they can't mm -hmm. believe how fast the vehicles are, how quiet they are, the infotainment system, how responsive it is. So from a software perspective, from a usab usability perspective, uh, the Model Y and Model 3, they provide tremendous value at that middle price point. And then um, cost to a lot of people is one of the biggest issues. But in that chart you showed, there was still a significant amount of people that said they prefer a gas engine. And when I look yes. at that, when yeah. I see somebody prefers a gas engine, that is like someone in 1905 saying, I like shoveling <laughs> shit you know, from my horse. I prefer yeah, yeah. the smell of the, of the stable, you know, versus my, you know, gasoline powered or electric vehicle back in 1910 or 20. And, uh, Oh my God, why would you prefer the complexity, the noise and the extreme inefficiency of a gasoline engine? I think what they, what they should have said is they prefer the rate, like, I, you prefer the range that's afforded by a gasoline engine. It, it, I just thought that was hilarious that it was on the chart. It was like the third or fourth one down. They prefer a gas engine. What? Okay. <laughs> so mo moving past that, the OEMs who make gas internal combustion engine vehicles right now, they're really struggling with the decision to transition all their efforts into EVs because the profitability isn't there the way that their businesses are set up. You're looking at 180,000 employees at General Motors. Thousands, probably 10, 20,000 engineers are transmission and emissions calibrators. I know a lot of people who work at General Motors, and that's what they do. So now those people need to transition to calibration efforts on what the thermal systems and drive lines of EVs but frankly the complexity of an electric vehicle drops dramatically because there's much less vibration there's less heat loss there's less noise so many of the complex problems that have been solved and cared for over the past 3 decades are eliminated because you have an electric motor that doesn't vibrate it doesn't violently shake it doesn't get hot, or it gets hot. It doesn't get very hot. And because of that, you have these organizations and these facilities and these testing facilities and these standards that were all developed for a dying solution to transportation. Yeah, so it looks like that um, the traditional automakers have a choice to make today, right? I just went through the price cuts. So they just did even more price cuts. And so I imagine that the board members of Toyota um, and uh, you know Ford and GM and others, they're sitting there going, what do we do? Because as you compare their Tesla, the Tesla cars against their cars, they're going to either respond and some of them might actually not be able to continue. Do they go all in electric vehicles or do they cut the electric vehicles? Like we just heard today that GM's going to cut the bolt production. And, um, you know, they have to decide, right, to, to stay right side to continue the margins, or do they just do a complete switch over? Um, what, what do you think their reaction is right now, the uh, traditional car makers? And what would your recommendation be to them? Well, if you're a traditional OEM and you saw Tesla raising their prices and raising their prices, what that did is that built in a spot for you to develop your business case. 
So if the Model Y price was rising, and it was rising, mm-hmm. it r- rose over 60,000 US dollars. Now an OEM, could, a traditional OEM could have been developing a product that would have fit in in that fifty to $55,000 range with similar performance and similar range and capability and over there updates. And you built your business case off of that, being able to be the low cost provider providing the same functional objective. Well, now Tesla just dropped that all the way down to 49,000. So now all of a sudden you are similar, maybe the same or slightly better to a Model Y, which is a now a three and a half year old plat- platform. If you count the Model 3 being the same platform, it's really a five year old, six year old platform. Now you're not the cost leader. The Tesla's the cost leader. And the Tesla has all the cachet and the street cred and people want Teslas and they don't even have to market and they can still make margin at that $49,000 number and increase their market share and retain their lead in the EV space. Now, when it comes to the Chinese players, it's a whole different story when you're talking about China. So I'm not super... Mm -hmm. Uh, well informed on on the China um, uh, aspect of it, but we just uh, you just have to kind of shake your head when you look at China because their market is so big that their traditional players can take up suck up all that volume. Look at uh, BYD, mm-hmm. Neo, Xiaoping, uh, and Tesla is playing pretty well in China, and they have their Giga Shanghai. But it'll be interesting to see how far they drop in China as other OEMs, you know, come online. Okay, yeah, let me show you that. I do have that prepared here. So this is the position of Tesla against China right now in 2023. So this is January to March 26. And you can see that ch- the top 20 models. This is pretty surprising. People don't, um, they don't believe me when I say this. That when you look at all the cars being sold in China, regardless of whether or not they're a battery electric vehicle or whether or not they're a hybrid or they're a fuel car, Model Y is the number one. This is irregardless of segment also and the price points because it includes the micros and the minis in here as well. So the number one is Model Y. That is the number one number of units. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. That's wild. And and wasn't it the top, top selling vehicle in Europe as well? It's it's top selling vehicle in Europe. So, but this is shocking because this is this is China, and everybody kept saying, if you look at it, okay, the number one is a B, a battery, the next one is a battery, um, then it's a, a hybrid song, then a fuel car, then you got the dolphins and the ones they're there as well. But you can see that the Model Three is the number ten, and a nice way to view this is this graph here, which explains a little bit. So it's hard for people to see this, but this is the um, the 2022 fiscal year market share of the electric vehicle market share. And you can see that the Model Y is up here. This is the price range. So around here, this is in yuan. So divided by seven, you'll get the $50,000, around $50,000 here, US dollars. The Model Y is the leader in the expensive premium. You got the Model 3, then you got your BYD Han and and the Zeker. Those are the ones um, competing in that premium. But whenever you hear that BYD is succeeding so much, it's because there's no competition. Tesla has no area to compete in the 30000 20000 US dollar or even sub. This is where you see the BYD Dolphin and you want plus. And then this is the micro cars, the mini EVs, sub $5,000, yeah. you know, <laughs> they're like just cheap cars getting sold. So all of this is where the Chinese market plays, but it comes to anything premium, but it is wild. It is wild. Um, so I wanted to ask you this. This is what's happening here in the U.S. This is January and February of 2023, the second column, um, how many units sold. And Tesla is number one. And you can see it uh, for two months, it's 95,000 versus Chevy, Chevy mostly by bolts, 14,000. And then 10,000 for Fords and Volkswagen. So this is how it breaks down in terms of who's selling the EVs in the last two months anyways, January, February. It looks um, like Tesla yeah. sold more than the next of they the do. Next, if oh, you the add them nine. all up, yep, all next time up, Tesla still sold well more than all of them together. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, so yeah, you know, we, you you know just, the the mainstream yeah. media though would focus on the the change aspect, right? And, and there would be an article <laughs> that says, uh, you know, Rivian, Ford, yeah. Volkswagen, and General Motors growth averages you know three thousand yeah. percent, and Tesla's lags behind at thirty five percent. You know, they'd be focusing on on the percentage year over year growth instead of you know uh the amount of vehicles because look it's actually an an additional what twenty four thousand vehicles which is more than the next two combined yeah okay so i wanted to ask you though i mean if you know you are the expert you've got you're in the auto industry and you're watching gm with their chevy bolts or whatever going from 92 to fourteen thousand, so they're finally making them but it's still smaller numbers yeah, that yeah. that's that's uh, skewed because I think they stopped selling in the mm-hmm. first quarter last year because of the battery recall. Remember that? Right. Gotcha. Yeah. That's so right. Right. they they were selling the bolt, you know, quarter by quarter. Then they had to stop selling them until they mm-hmm. figured out the battery recall. So that's why you see the fifteen thousand increase. But I think fourteen thousand is still relatively healthy. The Chevy Bolt is a good value if you just want an EV that's small mm-hmm. and cheap and you know, does things decent, but I don't think it brings the same uh, true value in in the functional objectives that somebody wants out of a automobile. It's too mm-hmm. small. The range isn't good enough uh, for for you know long road tripping. In my opinion, I think in order for a long road trip, you need at least at least three hundred miles of range to really comfortably drive across the country. I don't know. We'll see. That's an interesting chart. It is. Yeah. So what's your thinking right now with the OEMs and their progress with their electrical vehicle strategies? Are they producing enough? Are they way behind at this point? Are I, they? Do they have I plans think, to catch up in the future? I think the big bottleneck is battery sourcing and battery production. Mm-hmm. So look at General Motors. They have a backlog of orders for the Hummer. They do. I, I know we have mm-hmm. one on order. We ordered one. Yeah. We wanted to get one and tear one down. Yet they delivered two, two, two vehicles in the last quarter. <laughs> and because of that, it's like, why? You're telling me a multi billion dollar organization is having launch issues for a year. They know how to stamp the body panels. They know how to uh, do the castings and the gears and the motors. They've been doing that for years. Frankly, I think they can't scale up their battery production. They just can't. Each vehicle, 200 kilowatt hours, that's like four Chevy Bolts worth of batteries. Even if the margin's there, I don't know why they haven't started delivering the Hummers in earnest. And then they have the Silverado EV. Scheduled for what, 2024? The Lyric seems very delayed. They're starting with the high-cost, high-margin vehicles, and they're not producing very many of them. Why? What? It has to be something bigger at play, and I think it's battery production issues in general. Well, I'm going to explore that further with you, but I want to show you another interesting graph here um, that I found that I love to watch, which is, you know, can Tesla sell 20 million cars by 2030? A lot of people think that that's ridiculous when Toyota can only, is currently the leader today, sells 11 million cars, gas, but that's as much as they could sell. And this graph shows that if you take all of the forecasts, the forecasts of every car manufacturer, Tesla, BYD, the Chinese, all of the traditional car makers, if you add up all of their forecasts of what they think they'll be able to create by 2030, it actually, surprisingly, adds up to 80 million, which is the average number of sales, new car sales globally each year. And so the question becomes, well, this is if everybody actually hits their targets of what they think they should do. And this is with Tesla hitting 20 million, which is what they think they can do. The question is, how likely are all these other car manufacturers going yeah. to even approach that their own targets what's your it, yeah. guess on so that? yeah it, i will remember this interview in 2030 <laughs> and i'm going to come back and look at what i say here okay. so i think that the whole world will only be at 
40 million EVs mm -hmm. by 2030. 40 million. I think it'll be roughly 50% of global production. And so all of those forecasts added up, that's like in a perfect world where everybody gets it right. And I think that Tesla will shoot for the 20 million mark, but ultimately at that point, uh, land anywhere from 40 to 60% of their goal, which would be eight to 12 million vehicles mm -hmm. per year. So I still think they're the waiting, you know, the, 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 the amount of vehicles they sell uh, per EV sold will still be in that 20 to 25% range. So I think they'll be selling eight to 12 million of 40 million, not 20 million of 80. That's my prediction. Um, some of those charts may come to fruition. China, I think is the most likely that the China will come to fruition, but the other ones uh, I'm not, I'm not too certain that you'll get to that point where you have it, where the entire global fleet being sold is EV. I still think that we're that's going to be in the mid 2030s, late 2030s before the last internal combustion engine vehicles sold probably 2050. You know, in some odd markets, Africa, South America, I don't know, somewhere else. Okay, very, very interesting. So this is very interesting. So you think that that you know ICE vehicles are not going to go, um, not going to die that quickly. It's going to take a long time, slow death. I just interviewed uh, Larry Goldberg. He's a just an investor, longtime investor, but he was uh, he's projecting that he thinks that ICE vehicles will die very precipitously. It'll take a slow, but then it'll happen very quickly. I mean, you're watching Norwegian, um, Norway and other countries now at 70% sales. China's already closer to 50% sales of new, new EV of new sales yeah. each year is our EVs. Um, yeah. It's, it's and, the fringe cases will die. will take a long time to die. Let's say you own uh horses and you need to tow 30,000 pounds across the state of Montana. Try pitching an electric vehicle to that person. Mm -hmm. They're, they're going to hold on to their large diesel engine 3500 F350 for decades. It'll be like Cuba, where uh, 50 years from now, you'll still see farmers and ranchers holding on to vehicles built in the 2020s because they just they won't let them die. I think there'll be a weird sub-industry sub, mm -hmm. sub that keeps mm -hmm. gasoline engine vehicles alive for 50 to 100 years after the, the death of them. I, I truly and, but believe- But you're saying 50%. You were saying uh, still 40 million sales out of 80 globally new year by 2030. So even by 2030, yeah, I think you 50%. Have, yeah, you have to look at the place. underdeveloped nations. So mm -hmm. look at uh, Africa and South America the charging infrastructure so far behind and the buying power isn't there. So really you got to get the cost down low enough. If people cannot afford, like I was in Brazil in 2011 and it may have been, yeah, 2011. And the manager at this company that I was working at, the high up manager drove a tiny little a class car where I had to sit sideways in the back. Because it didn't even have four seats. It was like two plus one in the back. It had no NVH, crank windows, a little tiny mm -hmm. like three-cylinder engine, manual transmission, could barely go 60 miles an hour. And he was so proud of his car because it was expensive to own a car in Brazil. And he bought it in Brazilian reais, you know, reals, which is their currency. And the equivalent US dollar was like, I forgot, it was like 20,000 US dollars. And I'm like, this thing? And it was like a $500 Geo Metro. Like, that's what it was. So now go to Brazil and say, you want the whole Brazilian market to shift to EV? And say, oh, by the way, this vehicle that costs $25,000 in the US, you import it with all the taxes and fees and everything. If you don't make it in Brazil, they have huge import taxes. Now it's fifty or sixty thousand U.S. dollars. No one will be able to afford it. So that's why I, it, 
we oftentimes people have a myopic view of the future. They think of their scenario. They mm -hmm. think of their environment, their economic scenario, the prosperity of their state and country and mm -hmm. similar state and countries like, oh, you know, if you're a Westerner, you think of Europe and the US and Canada, all like, oh yeah, we'll just, everyone will buy EVs. But most of the times people are more focused on how they're going to eat their next meal or how they're going to make rent. And they could care less about whether their vehicle is electric or gas. They just care whether or not they have one to provide transportation for their children and family. Mm -hmm. So it, it 2030 is the target for about 50 to 60% of all vehicles sold being electric, but you will still have the majority of the vehicles that are in the world. Well, I sure. don't know. Yeah. will still be a gasoline. Billion. Yeah, yeah. Billion. So then now, you're penetrating 8% of the fleet, or eight, actually 4% of the fleet is being replaced by electric if you have 4% going out and 4% coming in, meaning you know, 40 million of a billion is 4%. So it, then you'll have people that aren't going to let their gasoline engines vehicles die. If they can't afford one, now you'll have a much more robust uh refurbishment and rebuilt uh environment to keep things going as mm -hmm. long as possible interesting that's complete opposite of what so many people are saying here's another graph you're gonna laugh at this one <laughs> you're gonna laugh at this one because it's just complete opposite of what you just said so this is uh the their actuals are in um in gray this is coming from general motors this gray actual um so the actuals up to 2021 and then everything else that are projections are coming from um, a user named JPR007, just kind of doing projections. And <laughs> some people are believing that, in fact, this is the gray is actually the gas cars, that it's going to fall dramatically quickly in 2022, 2023, and just disappear by 2030, which is opposite of what you just said. The blue is electric vehicle sales that will need to catch up and grow. And in fact, what this person is saying is that it's going to go beyond the 80 million and it's going to keep just going all the way up. This is with, um, you know, being electric vehicles, the cost of ownership is so low ongoing. You can produce the smaller uh, vehicles and so forth. Um, yeah, this complete opposite. And what they're trying to point out here is just simply that when, if, if the ICE cars die and somebody needs to make it up with EVs. And there, like you said, that the batteries may not be available that quickly. There's going to be a valley of death. There's going to be an area of what, who's going to provide the need and desire for these uh, cars. Yeah, I want to yeah. clarify this graph. So yeah. does the BEV, uh, the BEV bar, does that include mild hybrids and PHEVs? I don't think so. That's why it's BEVs, but yeah. Yeah, so you're telling me in 2030, mm -hmm. I can't go essentially anywhere in the world and buy something with a four-cylinder gas engine. Right, that's that's right. This that's, that's looks yeah, very Yeah, and low. also th this chart shows, you mentioned 80 million as total global demand for 2030. This shows 160 right. exactly. yeah, global demands. Is... So that, that demand seems double of what... Yeah the global yeah. demand of vehicles is. So that, that kind of contradicts with what I was saying because I was saying 40 million on 80 million demand. Complete opposite, yeah. Yeah, this is 110 million BEV sold on demand of one, 160. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, about 160. I, so that I wouldn't say it's complete opposite. It's a different scale and it's a different projection. So... Complete. I was just no, going. It is complete yeah. opposite. Yeah. The only yeah. reason I brought this chart up is because Martin Vieca, who's the kind of investor relations for Tesla, liked this chart, and he was, you know, postulating as well. What would happen if the demand is higher than the actual ability for all electric vehicles to make what they're making? Um, yeah, Sandy would say, "In comes China." So he thinks that the Chinese yeah. are set up to fill that valley of death. Yeah, they are. They are absolutely. They are. Yeah. Okay, so that's very interesting to see what you're saying. Now, the, the next thing I want to show is the, um, 
sort of the reason why some people believe that this 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 forecast is accurate could be accurate is because of all the regulations and laws that are putting put in place. Uh, many you're hearing not only at the state department or country de- level, but they're doing it at the, the the city level and so forth. And we've heard, you know, many of them are 2035. Uh, countries are saying by 2035 that a certain percentage of all new car sales must be electric vehicles. Um, and in fact, the Biden administration just passed one uh, or at least recommended the law. I don't know where it's at, but saying that 50% of all new cars by 2030. Um, so this is kind of a nice uh, roundup of all of the uh, the ICE, uh, sort of the IRA and how it's going to impact um uh, you know, which cars, and I'm going to just kind of show it here that the ones that are uh, available to get the full $7,500 tax credit. And by the way, apparently this is a $7,500 tax credit today, but by January, it no longer is necessarily a tax credit. You can actually get it right off of the sticker price right when you're buying it. Right now, you have to wait a whole year, wait for your taxes to come in and get a de- deduct, deduct it. But Anyways, these are the cars that uh, get the full tax credit, the Cadillac Lyric, the Bolt, the Silverado, Blazers, the Fords, Teslas, Model 3s, and Model Ys. These are the ones that are only half of that, 3750. And then these are the EVs that don't qualify for the tax credit down below. So it was just a nice roundup. But with these tax credits, um, and apparently I've, we've been hearing that Europe is about to launch their own version of a ta- uh, of an IRA tax credit, just like the U.S. does. So even with the governments all promoting this and, pro- and wanting this to happen, I think you're just saying that it's really hard to switch an incumbent yeah, industry. The tax credit, I would equate to a bailout. Yeah. So a tax credit makes an EV affordable to a consumer without putting the burden on the OEM to do the work to make the to bring the cost down low enough where they can make it at a profit. Mm-hmm. So with that $7500 tax credit, now an OEM can go, "Phew, okay, now we don't have to work so hard. I guess we don't have to refine the thermal system to the same level. I guess we don't need to use uh crazy manufacturing techniques. I guess we don't need to switch to a 48 volt system." Let's just keep doing things the way they are and let's let old Uncle Sam, you know, bail us out because ultimately you do pay for it, our taxes. So it may seem like, oh, yeah, it just wipes off the top. But where's all that money come from? Mm -hmm. It comes primarily funded by the U.S. taxpayer. So it's just real interesting to – I'm never a big proponent of incentives like these – EV credits, and uh, it's kind of crazy. But. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go back to the um, uh, the price cuts. Tesla's mm-hmm. cutting prices significantly. Uh, we talked a little bit about how uh, the traditional car makers might respond. But what about the pure play electric vehicles, Rivians and Lucid? We've had Elon kind of commenting on this a few times now, saying that you know when you're selling cars at a hundred thousand dollars or high. Um, you you not you've got a very very tiny little market available for you. The issue with these guys is that not only are they selling a very high in the expensive cars, but you as you would know, their costs are so high. They're losing twenty two billion dollars uh, versus where Tesla was at the same time in twenty twelve when they had their expensive car. They were just losing, they lost two billion dollars. So if they can't get their costs in place, they're gone. But with Tesla reducing the prices of their Model S's. Um, do you think that it, it, because it's a totally different market that they'll be fine? Or do you think that they just won't be able to sell? Nobody is going to want to buy a Rivian or Lucid at this point when you can get a better car at so much cheaper price. Yeah, when the Rivians first launched with their prices in the seventy dollars to $80,000 range, and then we saw what you were going to get, you were going to get a quad motor, this amazing suspension with the hydraulic stabilizer bar, uh, the frunk the wild bed with uh, storage, the crazy gooseneck hinge in the lift in the tailgate, the pass-through tunnel, um, the Alcantara interior, the really nice seats. Like it just went on and on and on. All the stuff you're getting, air compressor for the whole vehicle. And we got it 
and we tore it down and it took us a lot longer to get it apart and a lot longer to do cost analysis. So in general, we can tell what a vehicle will cost based on how much effort it takes mm. our team to do the analysis. You can almost draw a parallel. If it takes us an additional 30% in hours to do the cost analysis, the vehicle will typically costs 30 to 40% more because our mm. team is just, instead of 10 plastic parts, there's 20. Instead of 50 metal parts, there's 70. You know, it's just more parts, more stuff, more motors, more, 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 more. <laughs> and everything weighs more. And when it weighs more, the suspension has to be bigger. When the suspension's bigger, it costs more. Then the air suspension uh, system has to be larger than if the vehicle was lighter. So it just goes, it's just like a cascading effect of cost. So the Rivian R1T and R1S are, are wildly expensive, and our independent analysis showed that. So when they announced their price raises, we actually were like, oh, phew, that's good. Mm -hmm. Now they mm -hmm. actually won't, they'll stop bleeding money at like a massive pace and maybe at least start to stem that by generating slightly more revenue as they give them an opportunity to then cut costs uh, as they deploy the, the dual motor version instead of the quad motor, uh, other cost cutting measures. But the high end market is always interesting. Because you have Lucid, you have the Lyric, you have the Model S, the Model X, the Rivian, R1S, R1T, and now you have players like Mercedes and BMW with really nice vehicles with the EQS and the, the 7 Series electric, that large screen. And you'll see uh, people who typically bought Mercedes and BMW, they'll transition to another Mercedes or BMW. Mm. and Mercedes and BMW will be able to sell a vehicle in the hundred and twenty hundred to one hundred and thirty thousand dollars range, and it'll be the low cost option compared to a Lucid, and only slightly more than a Model S or Model X. And if you look at a Model S and a Model X, the amount of refinement in the interior is still much less than what you get right. in a yep. in Mercedes or a Maybach or a high level BMW. Just frankly, that's where the strength of some of those German OEMs are is really building fine luxury products with features that match the, the, their reputation and their brand name. So to kind of stay on topic, you know, answer your question, there's a small pool of people that can go spend a hundred, a hundred to $200,000 on a vehicle and get a new vehicle every two to three years. And it's getting real crowded and the novelty of being first in the space has quickly worn off. Mm -hmm. So you either need to be really good in that high, high end market. Like Lucid has a lot of unique advantages with the range and the powertrain, but I think they're lagging behind when it comes to their software and some quality issues they've been plagued with. If you just read in the news, they've had all sorts of recalls and bugs and different problems with their vehicles. And then, uh, Rivian has stated that they want to make uh, lower end cars that at a different price point, but they're going to have to hurry. They need to hurry that development and they need to capitalize on the demand before you have the traditional players enter the market like Ford and General Motors and BW and even Stellantis with a flood of lower end cars in that $25,000 to $40,000 range. And uh, Rivian is going to have to compete for those customers. So they'll have to offer more or better for less margin. Mm -hmm. So we were talking about premium cars. Um, what? Look, very curious to hear what your answer is to this one, which is um, people are saying that Tesla was originally a premium brand, but as they cut prices, they're going to be seen as a cost leader and you cannot exist as both a affordable car as well as a premium car and that it's a it's completely damaging the brand if all of a sudden somebody said that if your Uber driver and Lyft driver can buy a Tesla, <laughs> why would you, as a you know one of the people that are afford you know richer in this world, they why would they buy uh, a Tesla? Do you think that it's impossible for a car? I mean, I don't know if we've seen it before. It can be yeah. both affordable and premium branded. That's an interesting concept. The the question you just posed of like. What if my Uber driver can afford a uh, a uh, Model Three or Model Y? 
Well, if you're of that mindset, then buy Model S or Model X. I mean, just move up. If they've shifted all their prices down, you can move up in the price point. Because 84000 for a Model S, or whatever it costs, 90 75 it's a lot. That's not cheap. I mean, the average income in the United States, I think, is like forty five or forty eight thousand dollars. And if you look at rent and food costs, that doesn't leave you a, th- a fourteen hundred dollar a month car payment left. Yeah. I mean, if you look at what a car payment is on a hundred grand or eighty grand, it's it, it can be over a thousand dollars. So, for anyone out there saying, "Oh, I don't want to drive a Model Three or a Model Y," because there's been hundreds of thousands of them sold around the world and you want to be unique, go buy a BMW, a Mercedes, a Bentley, a Audi, a Ferrari, a Maserati. I think the, those decisions uh, always culminate in someone wanting to be different. If you want to be different, you can't buy a vehicle that is the that may soon be the global leader in sales because I think it may pass the Corolla this year mm-hmm. in global sales. I think the Corolla and the RAV4 and the F-150 sell, you know, 800,000 or a million vehicles a year. You may know this, but I think the Model Y could mm-hmm. be the global leader in sales this year. Yeah, that's what they're saying. So you're okay. Like you're saying that, uh, you know, if you're a brand not that whether you're premium or not, it's whether you have different segments. I mean, I think BMW did a very good job right that. They're very, very premium, but then they started low offering the the three series and others that, you know, yeah. are going lower and, and yet they maintain their premium brand, right? Yeah. Mercedes, I think mm. they did a right. 180. They went down. They developed a front wheel drive platform, I think about a decade ago. And they came out with the these odd front wheel drive, smaller vehicles. And they were more affordable. And it, I think it really did damage their brand. Because Mercedes mm. to me is longitudinal yeah. powertrain, rear wheel drive or all wheel drive off of a rear wheel drive platform with this certain look with a long front hood. And then they went to a kind of a more of a slightly more cab forward design on, on that. Mm. I don't know, it was a C300 or I forget what, or the A or A or B. I should know. I don't. But um, and then you'd see these people driving around in these Mercedes, and everyone would. I would look at them and I go, "Ah, that's that's not a that's not an E three fifty. That's that's not a G wagon. <laughs> what is that?" And uh, I think they that kind of damaged their brand a little bit, in my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. Um, uh, so it is possible if you're an established mm-hmm. player in a premium market. If you go down to get volume, you need volume then. And if you're not set up to do volume, then you're just going to sell something at a lower profit margin and then put more people in your brand that you may not want. Okay, wonderful. I'm loving this. I'm really enjoying being able to show you these graphs and charts that I see and to get your reaction for the first time. I haven't shown you any of this. I got another one. I think you're going to like this one. We're going to talk Cybertruck now. And I know that you've been... uh, diving deep in Cybertruck, and you guys really know what's going on, and you guys can actually spot what's about to happen. So Cybertruck, in the last earnings call last week, they announced that they're going to do a delivery event in Q3. Uh, Elon has made uh, many statements like, uh, this is a fantastic production line that he just walked. So alluding the production line is already there. And then uh, he's kept saying that Cybertruck is going to be the greatest product that Tesla has ever made. It's going to be one for the history books. But uh, this, I'm going to show you this table, this beautiful kind of spider chart. Um, I interviewed um, Lance King. He's the CEO of Cyberlander, which is this camper that pops up on the on the on the on the bed of a Cybertruck, and it's got a, a bed, it's got a stove, it's got um, it's got a shower and toilet. It's 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 amazing. Um, but what he was saying was this, okay, here's a cyber truck. If you look at different cars and what, uh, you know, the trade-offs you're d- buying by buying that kind of car, you're looking at performance, economy, luxury, automation, utility, and value. So if you look at the green, that's the economy car. If you're trying to buy economy car, you're going to get high value, high utility, high economy, but low, very low luxury, low automation, and very low performance. And that's that green uh, line there. 
Then if you go with a sports car, you're going really high performance and really maybe even high luxury, but everything else is lower. And then if you look at the pickup truck, which is red, it's usually high value, high utility, high luxury, but very low economy and low automation and low performance. Okay. And then Cybertruck, what he's proposing is that what's unique about the Cybertruck, it's actually going to be the best in all of these categories, performance, economy, luxury, automation, utility, and value. And so that's why he's suggesting that people are going to buy Cybertrucks who never bought a truck before. Even people that were originally buying an economy car might consider to buy a Cybertruck. Um, what's your reaction when you see this uh, you know, um, potential graph? As an engineer, I, I've, I'm first drawn to what is the data behind this? I'd have to disagree on okay on the weighting of this because if you look mm -hmm. at economy car, the value should be it has to be what are you trying to accomplish and how what is the denominator for the value? So if you if your goal is just to drive, to like literally go from point A to point B, then value to you for the economy car should be super high. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm struggling with the value line mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. But if he's factoring in all other things like utility, automation, and performance, then it's your value for performance, your value for luxury, your value for utility, and also luxury. Is the Cybertruck really going to be nicer than a luxury car? Mm -hmm. And he has it on par with that. It looks rather utilitarian inside. And mm -hmm. so luxury is subjective. Will it have 18-way massage seats? Will it have a cooler in the back for your champagne? Will it have a, a reclining seat like a like a Hyundai minivan in the back? No. Will the NVH characteristics be really good? Yeah. So the value and luxury thing, I would have to say, are very subjective. But the automation, utility are pretty good. And then economy. Is he talking about the... Uh, economy for um fuel efficiency yeah. like yeah so mm -hmm. the mpge for this thing yes will be good but he's saying economy car sports car luxury car these have to be internal combustion because if you just have an economy car as a model three or a lower end ev the economy would be better the fuel the you know the fuel economy so i think it's he's He's having an electric truck compete a bit against uh, five internal combustion engine segments. That's, that's got to be clear. He should be comparing an electric truck versus an electric vehicle in all these segments sure. in order for it to be apples to apples. No, I love it. Obviously, you are the data guy. You guys know exactly. So you you guys should create something like this. It would be interesting. Uh, but. I think the spirit of what he's saying um, just shows that the Cybertruck could actually be something that kind of has thought through all of these and uh, will do very well with some of these. So let's take a look at some photos. You um, sh you tore this apart a little bit and tell us what we're looking at here. So this looks like a Cybertruck. There's this, this one. Yep. Let me see it. Show you the three I've got just so you can pick the one you want to look at. There's this, yeah, this that, one, that, that one, this one, yeah. and then this one. Can you yeah, explain go, go, which one do you want to look at? Go back one to the uh, forward. Oh, which one? So this, this one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the thing that strikes me the most about this is how few parts you see in the photo. So can you count the parts? Mm -hmm. I can. <laughs> so you have the casting, which is obvious. It starts from the hinge pillar, which is that the white piece, uh, kind of the white piece that goes up and down on the right. No, yes. on the oh, right. On the right. Yeah. Okay. So that's called the hinge pillar. That is one. Uh, stamp steel part most likely ultra high strength steel which is mated to that casting with uh, uh structural adhesive and some threaded fasteners and then you have the casting which is one part which you can see has all of the ribs in it and the casting is very large and it encompasses the upper shock tower now typically teslas have had a steel reinforcement for the upper shock tower i can see a large black piece where the the air sh air suspension touches that's most likely a reinforcement to distribute the load throughout the casting and then notice that the suspension 
is at an angle. It's kind of unique. Mm -hmm. It's at a laid back angle, but it's a double wishbone suspension. Um, and it's not virtual ball. So from the other video we saw underneath, it has a double wishbone suspension, non virtual ball. And then you can see the out near the front end, you can see a small aluminum stamping. Yep. A little further. Yep. Right there. That is aluminum stamping that looks like four parts. You can see hmm. it's a weld mint that's welded on. That's called a fender bracket. That's how the fender will interface with the castings because the casting is large and rigid. And, excuse me. And when you're uh, putting the fender on, there has to be some conformance to get the fender to align with the hood and the bumper and the everything. So that's very typical. If you look at a Toyota or a Honda or a Ford, you have your core structure and then they'll weld on these small fender brackets that allow you to uh, uh, attach your fender and fascia and hood alignments. So from a structural perspective, that's one, two, three, four, five, six parts, mm -hmm. all welded or glued together with structural adhesive. And then you have the upper uh, triangle with the window for the A-pillar, a very relaxed A-pillar. And then technically that'd be the closeout of your A-pillar. Um, this looks to be steel and most likely interfacing uh, to the casting with uh, ultra... Um, with a structural adhesive and threaded fasteners as well. And then I also notice there's two little mounting provisions for the outside stainless steel. Now, people say, oh, what about the exoskeleton? The fact that you have this massive casting, super strong, super rigid, you see a traditional hinge pillar, which is very hard and very rigid. You will put a fender up here, the left front fender and the door. Mm -hmm. So because mm -hmm. you have a fender and a door, those are not exoskeleton pieces. Those are separate, mm -hmm. essentially close out vanity pieces. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, the only skeleton aspect of it is actually not an exoskeleton. It would be what you see, which would be an endoskeleton. endoskeleton. I, don't, I don't know if, the, I don't mm -hmm. know if that's the endocrine. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> because you can actually see the structure is underneath. It's a traditional, mm -hmm. this, this to me looks like a, a bloated, stretched geometric version of a model Y built in Texas, large giga casting up front, big giga castings in rear. You have stamped steel, most likely hot stamped steel, uh, body side structure for the door rings and It'll most likely have a structural battery pack. We'll see if it has the floor in it. I don't know if they're going to go that far to have the floor integrated, but you'll have a double stack. You know, it'll be a double stacked high battery using 2170s or 4680s, I'm guessing. And then uh, it, it's just, I look forward to when this vehicle launches uh, and when we get one or two or three or four. <laughs> I love it. And then this, what do you, is this, is yeah, this the so tent in um, new? Yeah. In Numi plant and California. Latham. Yeah, so I California. can see mm -hmm. what I can see here is you, you see the geometric shape of the roof line. That that's mm -hmm. gonna be very rigid. And all of the roof line and the white part, these are stamp steel pieces. And so you have stamp steel and aluminum, which is exactly how a model Y is made. You have a stamp steel structure for the mm. the, the outer the outer pieces of the body side because it's the most efficient material to use if you need a huge amount of strength and a low pack uh very small packaging because if you use cast aluminum the size of your pillars will get much larger and um this is the best way that that they have developed vehicles and unfortunately the box is in the way so you can't see mm -hmm. everything uh but that's uh, about all i can derive from this photo is is it's coming What's soon. This? And People are talking on nomadic tube. That's going to be a nomadic feature that you can actually power nomadic tools. That's just a, that's the air tank for the vehicle mm -hmm. for the air suspension. That's nothing. nothing that's nothing, nothing unique fancy. at all. Oh no. Okay. No, it's, it's unfortunate that the tank is not integrated into something else. Cause on the model S plaid model S, the air suspension is integrated into the cross, the strut brace in the, uh, front of the vehicle. So that is a separate air tank that they're going to be mounting somewhere, most likely 
I guess at the rear, the the rear of the second row passengers, like behind them, mm-hmm. either inside yeah. the vehicle or in the bed area, or maybe underneath the vehicle in the rear. I don't know. We'll see. That's just an air tank. And I also gotcha. looked at the the pieces and parts that were on the shelf over there. You can see suspension components lined up in black. I looked I looked all the way past on what was on the tables. Yeah. And I didn't see nothing jumped out too much. So Okay. I love it. Well, you're looking forward to the Cybertruck being launched for third quarter. Should be quite of interesting. Anyways, thank you so much, Corey. I really enjoy talking to you because you bring to our conversation both this unique, <laughs> intelligent discussion about knowing everything about cars and, and how they're manufactured, but you also have a business mind and you're the president and CEO of the company. You look at it from a strategy perspective and you bring that to the table too. So you kind of uh, tone down a little bit of some of us, uh, you know, uh, bulls of what we think is going to happen to the electric vehicle market ongoing. But at the same time, you also agreed and think that the Tesla's volume versus margin pricing is the right thing to do. Yeah. And it'll be interesting yeah. how the market responds to the price cuts. Yeah. And we'll have to see. 2030, I predicted about 40 million EVs, not 80. Right. We'll look. We'll look back here. So <laughs> I'm going to look back and I'll, I'll remind Grace if she's still working at Monroe Live. She's a, So Grace, <laughs> my uh, videographer, is working the computer and the audio here. So put, no. put, a, remind, put a reminder for 2030. You want me to. There's going to be an AI that will pull it out that day. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. <laughs> That'll All right, do thanks. For you, but thank you, Corey. So please follow Corey on Twitter. His handle is Corey Steuben. Sandy is at Teardown Titan. And of course, you got to look at uh, YouTube's Monroe Live. Monroe and Associates website is at leandesign.com. I'll put it on the description. As always, thank you so much, Corey. This is great. And uh, I'm looking forward to your podcast series. You guys are just absolutely taken off. So with your intelligent uh, conversations and input, it's really no no wonder. Thank you again, Corey. All right, thanks. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.